Welcome to Small Arm Solutions. Today we're looking at another build that I did, which I basically spec'd out everything for to build what I considered an ideal combat rifle. And most of this was done with my friend Monty over at Centurion Arms, uh, due to the fact that he's somebody who uh, puts out some of the best parts that I know of, and he makes his guns to be combat guns. Basically, any gun that he makes, uh, he would take into combat with him. But again, what I decided to do is I wanted to spec out uh, the exact parts. And again, every part that I have, I have a specific reason for it. So I think we're going to jump right into this. Now, of course, 5.56 millimeter and mid-length gas system. Two of the most important things uh, for me are the barrel, uh, which is going to be a heavier barrel. Now, the barrel on here we have is a uh, FN cold hammer forge barrel coming from Centurion. It's a mid-length gas system. Now, at the front, we'll see we have an ASR mount. This is so I can use my silencer co cans. So that's why I have that one on there. The barrel... Cold Hammer Forge process, I believe, is a more durable and a longer lasting barrel than the standard uh, button rifled uh, barrel that you see on a standard M4. Now, for as far as accuracy is concerned, uh, it's been my experience and the experience of many who've, who've really looked into it. The button cut barrels give you a little bit more accuracy, and you see that more on a bench condition. You wouldn't see it in a combat rifle, really, uh, because you have a sharp leading edge uh, on the rifling, which engraves on that bullet and gives you slightly better accuracy. And again, you're looking at that. Uh, you really have to take out most human error uh, and have match ammunition to be able to see it. In the, in the combat rifle, you generally won't see that. This is manganese phosphate, and it's chrome-plated. Still, to this day, uh, I'm not convinced that nitride uh, is as hard and is as durable as a chrome-plated barrel. We definitely know that the, uh, the chrome is corrosion resistance. It offers you, uh, easy, you know, much easier cleaning. Uh, and also, when chrome heats up, it gets more of a self lubricious to it. So you have... Three times harder than barrel still. You have the corrosion resistance and you have ease of cleaning. Those are things that are not disputed at all. Uh, still to this day, uh, I'm aware of very few, actually I don't know of any, military contracts that have adopted uh, a firearm with a nitrided barrel. That's still not something, that, something we still see more in the commercial market. Uh, we don't really see it in the law enforcement market. The next thing we have on here is the front sight base. This happens to be one of my favorite front sight bases that there are. It's the ARMS number 41B. And it's a folding front sight base that was designed by Dick Swan. And Monty, I had him drill and pin this into place because I am this is this is another one of my pet peeves that I have for a combat rifle is this has to be drilled and pinned. Um, because these, these have walked out on me in the past with the many different manufacturers of firearms. Uh, I'm a firm believer in drilling and pinning. Now, unfortunately, uh, this is no longer available in this configuration for drilling and pinning. Uh, I've had this for about I don't know, maybe 10 years. I've had I've had only a couple. I've had a few of these, uh, and this is unfortunately my last one. These are still available. You can find them w with the clamp-ons, which basically you, you know you're, you're torquing screws on. Uh, it's better than the set screws, so you can still get those. But this particular one here I have was drilled and pinned. Now the rail we have on here is a Centurion. It's a C4. Now the C4 rail, basically all you're doing is you're removing your uh, the the delta ring, the the, the snap ring as well as the spring weld and it goes right onto the barrel nut and it's how it aligns. You have two screws in the front. This particular one here is a nine inch because this is a mid-length gas system. This also has the, uh, the extension on here which, which goes over the, uh, the sides. The rail is their new M-Lock. Uh, we do have some of the Magpul uh, M-Lock rail protection on here too. These I, actually, I just put on here because I don't plan on putting any panels on here uh, and there's a lot more room for me to get my hands around. I did also put on a 1913 uh, rail on the on the bottom in case I just did decide I want to put a bipod on it. Now, for as far as the, uh, the lights lights concerned, I did put a, a tactical light on here. This is a Streamlight ProTac. The Streamlight ProTac, you're looking at a thousand lumens. This is an, this, this lights up a room. It's an incredibly bright uh, LED type light. This is hooked up to the to the pressure pad on, on the side, which, which I can hit with my thumb. Uh, the top here you have is uh, a button for constant on. You have the, pa the pad for momentary use. We also have, uh, they had come with some, uh, some rail adapters here so you could feed the wires through so the wires are not hanging loose, which is very, very important. Again, mid-length gas tube. Now the upper and lower receiver, these are Centurion arms. They're, they come out of uh, 775 T6 aircraft grade forgings. As you can see, we have the a standard magazine uh, release button on the right-hand side. We have the AMI charging handle. 
Safety is a Radiant Raptor Talon. Uh, this is one of my favorite safeties due to the fact that it's very high profile on both sides. Whether you're wearing gloves or no gloves, it's very, very easy to get to. Now the forward assist on here, this is something else that's not made any longer. Uh, this is a, this was basically a steel uh, teardrop forward assist with a checkering pattern on the back that's no longer made, unfortunately. Um, I do tend to like the teardrop forward assists that are made like this uh, because they will not break uh, the steel ones. However, you, know, you can put any forward assist on it you want. This was one that I had had, which I was quite fond of. So the, uh, the lower receiver is basically uh, a mill spec. Then we're going to flip it over. Now, for as far as the bolt catch and the, and the NB Magazine release, these are Battle Arms development. Um, I also normally use the Norgon uh, for the NB Ambi, Dextrous uh, Magazine release. However, I have to say that the Battle Arms development one is easier to use. Uh, it's much larger uh, paddle for to be able to operate it. And, of course, we have a much larger paddle uh, on here for the bolt release. Looking at the iron sights on the rear, this is the Arms 40. It's a low profile. We rotate down on the optic. This will engage. Now the arm sight is, is adjustable for windage, but it also has two apertures. Uh, this one here, as you can see, is the larger. It's the uh, it's zero to 200 meters. Then you flip up and you have the regular. Now, as you can see, this is co-witness when you engage the, the, front, the front sight. This is co-witness. If this battery was to go out in this DI optic, the, the red dot, you'd be able to uh, see right through here to use your iron sights. They fold right out of the way. Now, the optics I have on here are basically uh, DI optical. You have a three-part magnifier, as you also have a, uh, the, the red dot itself. Now, unfortunately, uh, DI Optical is no longer in business. Um, I still use it because it's a good site. Um, there's obviously many different ones that you can use. I do like having the three power magnifier on there because as a, as a combat rifle, you can go from close quarter battle to, uh, you know, to well over 100 meters plus, where this would come in a lot handier uh, to be able to engage longer range targets. And it's very easy to just fold it out of the way. This charging handle is brand new from Springfield Armory. This is probably one of the most useful tools that I've seen in probably 20 years of this weapon system. Now the forward assist has been put on there and it's been left there since the Vietnam era and the forward assist has caused more problems than it's ever solved because basically what you're trying to do is, is to force a bolt closed. And if the first thing that you do is when your bolt fails to close, you want to get that round out of there because it's telling you that there's a problem if it's not closing. Most of the time when it's, when it's, when it's malfunctioning that way, you have a cartridge case that's damaged that's, uh, that, you know, that, that can't close on. So by trying to ram the forward assistant, all you're doing is forcing that in more and it's, and it's causing it to fail. And what's eventually going to happen, you're going to have to uh, remove that cartridge when after you're done slamming it into place. You're going to have to do what's called mooring. Mooring is where you're going to take the rifle and you're going to slam it on the butt on the, on the, on the, on the ground and, and open it. Well, this is what's referred to as a rearward assist. What this does is when you have that failure to feed or failure to lock and, it, and the bolt's jammed, you push a button and that swings this arm open. So what this does is when you pull rearward on here, this gives you the leverage that you would need to unlock that bolt to remove that round that's stuck. This will cure any malfunction that you have short of a rim shear or a separated cartridge case. So any kind of a malfunction that you have in here that you've caused with your forward assist or that you've had by a damaged round, this will save you significant amount of time, significant amount of effort in having to undo that malfunction by having that leverage. This is useful. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, the forward assist should be removed and these should be put on. Anybody who's in a desert environment or any kind of environment where you're going to get sand or dirt or heavy grains of sand in between the cartridge case and that chamber, which is going to cause the failure to extract, this is a must. This will save a dramatic amount of time. You'll see a separate video that I'm going to be doing on, on this. Um, but this is an incredible uh, piece of equipment. You push the button down, it locks right back into place. It gives it's oversized here also for you to, uh, you know, if you to be able to handle. It does sit up a little bit higher. I did like this with firing it suppressed too because it sat up higher, it prevents a lot of the gas from coming out to the front. But that's a new product that you're going to be seeing that we're going to be talking about. Ready.
and that's by Springfield Armory. So next thing we're gonna talk about is the bolt carrier group. The bolt carrier group that I chose is, most of you who know me, you know that I am a big proponent of chrome carriers, and that I am. Now this particular chrome carrier here comes from Young Manufacturing. Young Manufacturing probably manufactures uh, one of the finest chrome bolt carrier groups that's out there along with Smith Enterprises. Uh, Smith Enterprises is relatively hard to get a hold of just due to the fact that you uh, they don't manufacture them very often and they pretty much only manufacture them for brown owls. Uh, however, this is, a, this is a very similar in quality. But again, chrome carrier bolt. Now, if you notice on the top, you will see it's not staked. Well, uh, Smith Enterprises and Young Manufacturing are two companies that basically will tell you that it's not necessary. And the reality is, is that's true. As long as these, are, these uh, carrier key screws are put on properly, uh, it's not. And in this case where you're using a high temperature Loctite and a 50 to 58 inch pounds, this is not gonna come loose. Uh, unfortunately, if you were to try staking this because the hard chrome, uh, you'd end up cracking instead of bending in like the softer metal of the regular carrier key screws. And so I, I'm not concerned about it at all about this one not being uh, being staked because it's, uh, it's it, again, it's not necessary. It's a mill spec, um, but as long as it's done right, it's not necessary. So we're gonna take a look at this bolt. Now the bolt that's being used now by Young Manufacturing is the new HM bolt, which has been modified to be made more durable. Now, most of you who are aware of the issues with bolts, they normally will crack on these edges right here and the bolt will break in half uh, due to excessive wear. Now what H&M did was they left this whole end here intact. So basically you only have the top area on here, which is open and you have a solid bottom and they've modified the cam pin to a smaller diameter and made it a little bit shorter so it's much more durable. So we have a, an improved quality bolt. Also, I'm not taking it out because this is extremely hard to get back in. We have a five coil recoil spring and a rubber uh, O-ring on there for extraction. So we have a chrome bolt carrier and why do I like chrome bolt carriers? Well, first off, you have the same thing with the, it's being harder than barrel steel. Also, you have a more lubricious finish on here than you do with uh, manganese phosphate. Manganese phosphate, depending on how the uh, the carrier is treated, it can be rough or it can be smooth. A lot of times when it's rough, it can work like sandpaper inside the upper receiver. Smooth as can be. For as far as cleaning is concerned, these for the most part, you take a rag and you wipe everything right off. And because of the color, you're able to see uh, that all the dirt is gone. So this is the easiest material out there to be able to clean and maintain. Uh, and also, uh, as chrome heats up, especially it works well within the uh, bolt and carrier fit itself. When that heats up, it's much smoother. It's, uh, it's chrome heats to have a self-lubricating -lubric uh, property to it. Increases the reliability. The issues with chrome back in the Vietnam era were with the... the you know, the inner granular exfoliation, basically what happened was, was they had a very poor uh, process for, for chroming and some of the manufacturers the Colt was using would crack. And once the chrome would, would crack, uh, moisture would get underneath that crack underneath and it would cause corrosion and it would cause the chrome to flake off. That's long gone. Uh, they've perfected the chroming process where they fixed that. Let me put our bolt back, bolt back in. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to take the upper lower receiver apart and we're going to take a look at this lower on the inside. Now, due to the fact that I have a heavy barrel on here, I have an H2 buffer in here. Um, if this was a regular mill spec type, I could go with an H, but since this is a, uh, a heavy barrel, I utilizes the H2 barrel. Now, the trigger we use in here, uh, I've had a couple of them in here. Uh, this one I just put in because I wanted to give it a try. The trigger I've had, I had in for quite some time was uh, a Centurion Arms uh, two-stage trigger. Excellent uh, nickel-plated trigger. This one here is the Geisley SSA. Uh, I just put this in here because I want to see what the difference was between the two of them. And I have to say, there's a yeah, there's 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 a small difference. I mean, I, it's hard to it's uh, you, you definitely have to say that Geisley, when it comes to uh, two-stage triggers, probably makes the best in the industry. Uh, however, uh, if you look at the price compared between the Geisley and the Centurion, 
there's no way that I would spend the money for the uh, the Geisley over the Centurion. Uh, I just haven't had a chance to pull this one out uh, because I originally I shot most of my rounds so far you know with the with the Centurion, but this particular one here is the the Geisley. So we can look a little bit closer. We can see the Ambi uh, Talon. Now this also has the 45 or the 90 degree throw. I tend to prefer the standard 90 degree just because I'm a creature of habit. You see the other side, and again, much larger uh, bolt catch on here, much larger uh, on the Amy Magazine release. Now the pistol grip, well, those of you who follow me know that the Magpul Myad is my go-to of all pistol grips. Uh, to me, it is the most comfortable that there is uh, with larger hands. Um, absolutely, I always put, I always use that. Now, for as far as the stock is concerned, uh, this is the Volt, this is the Voltor, um, I, the Voltor iMod stock. Now, this is something else that you see me use, and there's a reason for it. Uh, back in my Colt days, when you looked at uh, the stocks that Colt had chosen on their SCAR programs, and they put on all of their specialized rifles, has been the Voltor iMod. And the reason being is they did a lot of drop testing in Colt when they decided when they determined what they were going to put on all these special operations and all these different guns that they were going to use. And they always came back to this one. This one had, had passed every drop test that they had done, whether it was on the on the heel, on the bottom. Uh, it the, the durability uh, was just uh, excellent. And I remember that research that they did, and I trusted it. And that's one of the reasons why I tend to like to use the Voltor uh, stocks all the time. You do have the you know, for your battery compartments in there as well. Now the receiver extension here is also uh, made by Voltor. It has the one, two, three, and four or five on the top. It's, it's a five position instead of a four position. Uh, their E their E five gives you gives you uh, even more positions. So uh, that's basically the lower receiver. Now I had set this up so it could be suppressed as well because we use suppressors uh, quite quite often. Another little neat thing that I put on here was uh, it was a, the Polymer Strike Industries ejection port cover. Uh, polymer again, it's just, it saves a little bit of weight, and I like it. Uh, it's it's form fit too. It's a better seal than the aluminum one, uh, and these are a little bit more durable, I think, than the aluminum ones as well. But just something else. We also have a uh, Battle Arms Development magazine release on here too. So what I think we're gonna do is we're gonna take this to the range. We're gonna see how it shoots.
Now we're shooting at our challenge target, uh, steel target out at 100 yards. Um, again, the challenge targets have really made you know, my enjoyment of, uh, of shooting a lot more. It's a lot more fun than trying to, to just put holes in paper. We do have a, a code for challenge targets that you can save 10% off of every steel target that they have. So if you're interested in getting us some steel targets, that's an excellent place to go. So again, when I build a rifle, I build a rifle that is for durability and for combat. There's a big uh, idea of we want everything as light as possible. Uh, so we, you know, people want to go with pencil barrels. Well, I'm going to remind you of some issues that we had with the M4 carbine early in the, the global war on terror. When the rifle was first introduced to the military, it was designed as a lightweight carbine, which is why it had that lighter profile barrel. And that was designed for non-combat personnel. It was for support staff um, who weren't going to be getting in any, any uh, major firefights. Well, once it became popular, it went into to use, they started using it as a primary weapon. And one of the complaints that you heard in combat, the gun would overheat. Well, the reason the gun would overheat was because that was not a combat barrel. That was a lightweight uh, barrel that was designed for support personnel. Um, it would overheat. You'd have failures to extract. And it wasn't until they found that their M4 product improvement where they would finally turn the M4 into a actual combat rifle by adding the SOCOM barrel instead of the, uh, the standard light profile barrel. The SOCOM barrel makes this rifle a combat rifle. It takes care of the overheating problem. It more than doubles the uh, the durability for as far as to destruction. You know, you're looking at a, a mil spec M4 barrel, uh, the standard, which will have basically about 450 rounds of continuous fire before the barrel overheats and blows. The SOCOM barrel, the heavy barrels, you're looking at going uh, over 900 rounds before you have that kind of a failure. You look at issues like ambient temperature, you look at all that. So lighter is not always better, and especially for a combat rifle. For a limited use or for a target rifle, that's great. Uh, for a combat rifle, we're going to be uh, actually engaging targets, and you can get into a firefight, which could get your gun extremely hot. You don't need your gun uh, overheating uh, and having those failures to extract and failure to, and those, those other failures that go along with that. So the heavier barrel is, is, a, much more, uh, is, is a much more viable uh, combat barrel. That's why I chose that. Handguards, with, like with the C4, I wanted I want it free-floating. I don't have any vertical pistol grips on here, but if you were to have a vertical pistol grip on here, having that free-floating barrel, when you would pull downward on that pistol grip, the barrel is still free. So you have no tension on the barrel. You have your free-floating barrel for accuracy. You know, again, the optics setup that I have on here, again, it's uh, it's practical. If I'm going to be in close quarter, I could drop that down and I have my regular old red dot. If targets are going to get further away, I engage that. We're ready to go. This rearward assist, which is what, which is what which is really what we're calling it. It's not a forward, it's a rearward assist. This is useful. This is not. Uh, we're going to be doing a video where we're going to be showing you. Uh, we're going to simulate. Um, you know, any, any of you guys who've done a lot of shooting, you're going to have cartridges that are not going to chamber because... The shoulders are damaged, uh, they're out of round, and they won't fit into the chamber. And of course, people want to do is they want to smack it in and try and get it to go in further. Well, you're not going to do that. Uh, all you're going to do is jam it in further. And when you have to basically grab it and bang it on the ground to try to, try to open it, trying to do that in combat, the amount of time that's going to take to actually do that versus, you know, just pop that over and going like that and, and, and going right back at it. And again, with the all that extra uh, torque that you get on here, Everything I've tried so far, uh, for as far as trying to jam this rifle up, this thing is taken care of with no problem. Um, this is actually useful. This is not. This causes problems. This corrects problems. Uh, and I'm a firm believer in that. Uh, a lot of people are going to talk about the fact that, uh, you know, this is for silent uh, loading, which is complete bull. Because if you try to load around and that, as soon as that bolt goes over to, uh, to hit the cartridge, it's not going to snap over. The amount of effort it's going to take on that forward assist to overcome for that extractor to overcome that rim, then you're going to hear that snap that the it's going to go over. First of all, the amount of pressure on here you're going to be banging on it to get it to uh, the, the bolt carrier to go over that uh, rim because of the high you know the, the pressure on the extractor spring, and you're going to hear it snap anyways. So for as far as uh, is silent reloading, there's a lot of things that people like to talk about, but in reality, it's not going to be a silent. It's not going to be silent at all. So. The other thing that people talk about is for press checks. Well, press checks is purely a training thing that people don't trust and their, their weapon is loaded. Uh, so that's that's a tactical uh, issue. It's not a uh, mechanical issue. Should that be on there for just press checks alone? I don't think it's worth it, but uh, some people some people will. This 
charging handle corrects problems, this causes problems. Uh, there's no doubt in my mind about that. The parts that we see here, all the Centurion components are available uh, on Centurion's website. We do have a code for that too. It's for all the components, the receivers, the barrels, and so forth. Now, for as far as the bolt carrier group, you go right to uh, Young Manufacturing, uh, where you can get the, the, the chrome bolt carrier groups. Uh, again, the, the arms, that's the, these are all you know, you know, Brownells uh, type things if they're available. Unfortunately, my front sight base is not. The barrel, Centurion arms. Uh, you know, again, the, the, the flash hider, that's uh, Silencer Co. For my, for my sound suppressors. Voltor, most of this stuff is all available from Brownells uh, Centurion. Uh, so if you have any questions, uh, you know, leave us a message down there. We'll try and get back to you. If you enjoy this video, please click like, please subscribe, and even better, share.